Welcome along, little children, children come along. along While the moon is shining bright Get on board and down the river we we'll go We're going to raise a ruckus tonight Good boy.
Feels like I'm dying cause she's gone. She's solid and gone. And we're gone. got some incredible musical talent here tonight. I'm thrilled. But how about your house band right here, the 1937 Boys? <laughs> but you are exactly right. We're, we're, we're talent laden tonight. There's no <laughs> doubt about that. We'll start things off with Siamese Cycle, a musical duo based out of Huntington, West Virginia, composed of Emily Clover and John Parsons, possessing an eclectic style due to a variety of musical influences. The best description of their sound is ghost folk punk. And vocalist Emily Clower is a Marshall University graduate with a background in opera, classical folk, and jazz singing. She's currently teaching voice and piano lessons right here at Route 60 Music. And guitarist John Parsons is a sound engineer at Suave Sounds in Ashland, Kentucky. He was, or it could, it could be Suave Sounds, I'm not sure. Um, he, he, he received his uh, degree from Full Sail in audio engineering. He's been playing guitar since age 16 and has played in several punk bands. So both are contributing to the lyric and the music writing process and we're looking forward to hearing exactly what ghost folk punk is. So <laughs> please, a warm round of applause. Siamese <laughs> Cycle, ladies and gentlemen. Siamese Cycle. actually a Halloween song. It's called Luna Taking Time Bomb. Doesn't mean I'm trying to be sweet It was a long dark night when I knocked 
is called Glass Ego. job tonight and I just love your lyrics and I love the sound of your song. It's a lot of fun. I mean it. Thank you so much. So so that's what ghost folk punk is. Yes. <laughs> We're now enlightened folks. <laughs> yeah. And when did you start singing? I have been singing as long as I can remember like ever since I was little teeny tiny. My mom is here. She can verify that. <laughs> She's nodding. And John, when did you pick up the guitar? Uh, probably when I was around 16. About 16? I don't know if we can get a mic here for you, because we want to hear what you have to say. So I know that you you guys have been playing at Black Sheep. Yeah. And uh, what, are, what are some of your hopes and dreams for the coming months and years for Siamese Cycle? Well, we are actually working on finishing an EP, so hopefully we'll have an album soon, and that kind of, like, that's the big goal right now. <laughs> Do songs just come to you? Do you have to work at it? How does that process work? Well, I write a lot. I just write a ton of stuff all the time. So we just kind of weed it out, like what's what's good stuff, what's not so great, and then we work together to to get the music together. And sometimes, like he'll come to me with some a musical idea or a a song idea, and we just kind of write together and 
that's that's kind of the creative so process. So if the spring is flowing, get it. Yeah. <laughs> it's something we always ask of all of our guests. If you had your druthers and your wishes and dreams, who would you like to perform with? I mean, for me personally, I am not entirely sure. I would love to play with the Wayla Jennies just because they're like my favorite. <laughs> so <laughs> they're just amazing. John? <laughs> smart man, smart man right here. I was going to say, what a good answer. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I wasn't so nice with my answer. <laughs> well, I'm dying to hear a couple more songs. All right. Okay. Yeah, we have some more for you. All right. Fantastic. Two Ladies. more from Simon Cycle, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Cinematic Jellyfish.
fantastic. <laughs> Emily Clore and John Parsons, Siamese Cycle. And look for their extended play release. It's coming. And uh, stop by uh, Black Sheep Burritos. That's where you can see them with the open mic nights, right? Big time. You All betcha. Right. Love it. Love it. And let's continue on here as uh, we get closer to Turkey Day. <laughs> <laughs> I could tell a couple more jokes. I won't go there. <laughs> but we've got Paul, Jim, Randy, Michelle, and Charlie, your house band, the 1937 Flood. Woo! Yeah. Rain so swift, clouds won't lift, gates won't close, railings froze. Get your mind off when it's time, you ain't going nowhere. Who we ride behind? Tomorrow's the day my bride's gonna come. Whoa. Boys, and pack up your tents. You ain't going nowhere. Who we ride behind? Tomorrow's the day my bride's gonna come. Oh, oh, oh we're gonna fly down in my easy chair. This song a few days ago during the storms. It's kind of pretty now, but it'll storm again. So just do this. You know, song. if you don't like the weather, Charlie, just wait about 10 more uh, minutes. It'll change. It's totally okay. Don't know why there's no sun up in the sky. Stormy weather. Since my man and me ain't together, it keeps raining. Just 
Can't get my poor self together It keeps running all the time Well, since he went away The blues walking in me If he stays away The rocking chair will get me Every night I pray The good Lord will Something else we love is uh, raising funds for worthy causes. And again, because you've come tonight and paid your fee at the door, thank you so much for allowing us to let those proceeds go to the Boys and Girls Club of Huntington. Thank you for that. We, we deeply appreciate it. Once again, for more than a century, Boys and Girls Club to help out young people on the path to great futures with a mission to enable, to enable all young people, especially those who need help the most, to reach their full potential as productive, caring, responsible citizens, the Boys and Girls Club of Huntington. Thank you. Hey, you know, I've heard some tall tales in my time, but I'm ready for a brand new tall tale. Randy Yoey, you've got that moniker of storyteller, and we're ready. If you're ready, we're ready for a tall tale. What do you say? Are you, uh, are you ready for a tall tale? Yeah. Randy Yoey. Well, you know, it's a, it's a pleasure to work around all these celebrities and entertainers and, and in 30 plus years of being a TV news reporter, I got a chance to work around a few other uh, celebrities and entertainers, and, and uh, I got a little short list. Uh, these are actually true stories, because um, my wife's heard them all way too many times. Um, we'll go back to, and, and all these seem to, you know, they, they were like at the beginning of my career, very, very early on. 25 years ago, I think this year, Garth Brooks was playing at the uh, Charleston Civic Center. And Channel 3, Channel 8, Channel 13, we each got five minutes with him. So it was my turn. I had a photographer, and there were two chairs set up in the camera. We put a mic on him, and he, he's sitting there, and I asked him a couple of questions. And um, I was just about to get married. And for some reason, that came up in the conversation. And I said, yeah, I'm going I'm to be getting married here in the next couple of weeks. And he looked at me, and he goes, how old are you? I said, I'm 40. He goes, you're getting married when you're 40 years old? And I said, yeah. He goes, well, wait a minute. And he had me sit in this chair, and he sat in the interviewer's chair and told the photographer to keep rolling. He goes, what the hell are you doing getting married at 40? You know, and just, and I'm like, what? What is he, you know? So uh, he, he, he was just having fun. But it took, took me by surprise. He autographed a uh, CD for my wife and gave us really nice uh, seats for the show. And, and pointed us out at the show, and that, that was kind of a thrill. Um, John Cougar Mellencamp. This is when I was working down at a TV station in Savannah, 
And if you've ever been to Savannah, there's River Street. And it's right down on the river, a little narrow strip. And there's two ways to get into it, at the upper end and lower end. And then above it are all these big, tall warehouses where they used to ship all the cotton in and out uh, back at, uh, in, in the 1850s and 60s and such. And so Mellencamp is shooting a video down there, and they got it all closed off. Well, it was my assignment to go interview him. Anyway, so, so we're trying to do that. So we go to one end, and there's these two big, burly guys with security on there, and they wouldn't, I mean, they wouldn't let us in at all. Go down to the other end, two other guys, I think they were like football players from Savannah State. No, wouldn't let us in. Well, Alex and I, my photographer, we knew where those, some little secret tunnels were that they had through those old warehouses. <laughs> so we snuck through one of these tunnels and, and saw the uh, trailer down there, and as we Getting close to the trailer where we think Mellencamp is, out comes this woman, one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen, full Indian princess garb, Native American princess garb, just like, I mean, it, it, we dropped in our, our tracks, and, and Mellencamp comes out behind her, and he's got his tight jeans on, his white t-shirt, his lucky stripes are rolled up in his sleeve, I mean, it's full John Cougar Mellencamp, <laughs> and so we start to talk to him, and out of the corner of my eye, I see these two burly guys coming, running down the street. It's like slow motion. They're going, no, no, no. Because yeah. we slipped by them. I mean, and you can see, see them coming closer and closer. I thought they were going to crash into us. And Mellencamp goes, hey, these are the local reporters. Let's just talk to them. They're like, they deflated like no one's business. And we got, we got the interview. Um, Cab Calloway. Wow. I got a chance to interview Cab Calloway right before he passed. This was also in Savannah. And he was on tour, he had to be in his late 80s then, and his daughter was taking care of most of the tour. He'd come out for a couple of songs. So beforehand, and this is right near Forsyth Park, if you ever saw Forrest Gump, I'm interviewing him right near the bench where Forrest was eating his box of chocolates. And uh, so I'm asking him because Tybee Island, they used to have a big pavilion, and in the 20s he'd play out there. And uh, I was asking him about that, and he was glad to talk about it, and then I said, and this is where he got really pissed off. Uh, and I said, um, well, what about that song you did in the late 20s called The Reefer Man? You know, tell me a little bit about that. And he said, we ain't talking about no river. He said, I was talking about up in New York. That guy asked me about that. It was in the New York Times. And he said, get over here. And the guy's his daughter, get him up. And that was it. I mean, the interview <laughs> ended right there. Boom. He was up, out, never saw him again. Um, Count Basie. I got a chance to talk to Count Basie. Um, and he, it's during his sound check, and he's, had a, this, and he's got his orchestra there, and he's sitting at his big black piano, and he's got his, like, uh, you know, the sailor cap that he wore. And I'm talking to him a little bit, and he goes, come on, sit down next to me. And I'm, I'm sitting next to the, on the grand piano next to Count Basie. And I asked him, I said, you know, why only, you know, because he was a minimalist. If, you know, Basie's orchestra would play, and he'd go, plink, plink, plink. And that was it, you know. And then they'd, they'd play for another 10 minutes, it seemed, and he'd go, plink, plink, plink. And I said... Why such a minimalist? You know, you're the you know, one of the great, great guys of all time. You and Duke Ellington and Glenn Miller and all. He goes, he says, when I was a kid, I used to play the Dickens out of those keys, man. And he says, now I got, I'm old. I got this orchestra. Why should I waste my time? It's not how how much you play. It's how you play what you got. And, and, and I said, well, that makes good sense. So, but that was some surreal. And uh, that same uh, time, I got a chance to interview Bill Monroe. And uh, so I'm talking to the father of bluegrass, and I, and I said, toward the last question, I said, now, I recently talked to Dr. Billy Taylor, who is the great jazzologist out of New York, and Dr. Taylor told me that jazz was America's true classical music. Well, I think I read where you said bluegrass is America's true classical music. Which is it? And Monroe tips his hat and stuff like that, and he's just... He, you know, he, he'd heard all, every, you know, he'd been interviewed by Jillians and heard every question. I don't think he'd heard this one. So he paused for a second. He said, well, he says, I appreciate the esteemed Dr. Taylor, and I understand his point of view, but he said, bluegrass has to be America's true classical music. And you can quote me, and I, and I did. Um, <laughs> uh, two more. Uh, Ted Nugent. Um, <laughs> I'm telling you what. So Ted's playing here at the Huntington Civic Center, and uh, he doesn't like to do many interviews. So I come up and I talk to him. Well, Ted Nugent and the Amboy Dukes started in my hometown. Not, I'm, I'm from suburban Detroit. And not just Detroit, but my suburb. In fact, the, the drummer 
and the bass player went to my high school. I saw Ted Nugent, first of all, when I was like, I think 12 or 13, and he played on the tennis courts, and they put a little raised stage at Garden City West Junior High for a quarter, and he was wearing a loincloth and a big Indian headdress and shooting <laughs> flaming arrows. So I started to interview him, and he, you know, he's trying to you know, get out of the interview, and I, and I said, well, Ted, I'm from Westland, Michigan, and I know Robbie, and I knew Deke. He goes, oh, he says, you're from Ted's world, huh? <laughs> and I said, yeah. And so he then went on and gave me an interview. He was, and I, I talked to him about that, and he remembered, I think, uh, the headdress and the arrows and so on and so forth. And, and finally, it wasn't an interview, but Bob Marley. I mean, hmm. one of the, the greatest of, of all time. And I was just, I was living in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and he's playing Hill Auditorium. And I just knew some guys that were working backstage, so I'm like listening to the whole show backstage, like leaning next to the, where the ropes are and stuff. And, and I just, and it was blown away. And, um, and I just only gotten into reggae music a little bit earlier. And so he comes walking off stage, and I'm like starry eyed and star -sucked. And I said, Oh, Mr. Marley, Mr. Marley. I said, Well, fantastic. He, he patted me on the head <laughs> and said, Thank you. And that was just a thrill enough for me. There's a, there's a few brushes with greatness. Our storyteller, Randy Gary, ladies and gentlemen. All righty, thank you. Well, we got a storyteller, too. We have a guest artist tonight that you've heard a couple times, Jim Rumba. And Jim has discovered a story song that's really dear to uh, Huntington's heart. Tell him about it, Jim. Sure. Back in two seconds. Ready yet? Oh, now we're good. Back in 2001, uh, there was a, some people put together a group called the Harmonica Club, and that's where I learned to play harmonica. And one of the uh, gentlemen that used to be there in the early days um, was Fred Miller. And I remember he was sitting on the front steps of where we were uh, meeting, and he was singing this song, and I heard him say, Huntington. And I had never heard a song that had Huntington mentioned in it. I said, I want to learn that song. He said, well, it's called Billy Richardson's Last Ride. So I did go out and learn a song, and I learned a little bit of history. Turns out Billy Richardson was an engineer for the c &O Railroad. Uh, he started somewhere about 1890, and he did a train called the Fast Flying Virginian, and he went from Hinton to Huntington, back and forth, back and forth. That was his, uh, his route. He was kind of famous because he had this long flowing beard and he would all lean out the window and wave at everybody with that beard just flapping in the breeze. And everyone got to know Billy, just like you would get to know your bus driver up and down your route. Well, he was uh, their transport man. So Billy was coming from Hinton to Huntington. He had left Charleston. He was in a part of called Scary Creek near uh, Milton. And he had leaned out to see what you know, was happening and waved at people, but there was a, uh, a cr uh, unsecured mail crane. Hit him in the head, he died. Now, the tr that might have been the end of it, but in 1926, there was one people that he used to wave at, wrote a song about Bill Richardson, came in minor hit. And it's called Bill Richardson's Last Ride. One, two, three. <laughs> West Virginia mountains came the early morning mail. Old number three was westbound, the fastest on the rail. It pulled right into Hinton, a junction on the line. With its Baldwin Mallee engine, it made the run on time. Billy Richardson at Hinton was called to make the run, to pull the fastest time freight from there to Huntington. His firemen then reported for duty on the line And receiving their train orders left Hinton right on time The firemen said, now Billy, you know you're old and gray Your name is on that fishing list, you should retire someday But Billy said, dear fireman, this truth I'm telling you I must die right in my engine cab and nothing else will do so Billy told that fireman how happy he would be 
If he could die while pulling a train like number three, I want to die on duty in my engine cab so free while pulling eastbound number four or westbound number three. River came westbound number three. By Thurman and by Cotton Hill, no danger did he see. But his head had struck a mail crane while going down the line. He'll never make that run again to Huntington on time. He did the fast excursion, he did the U.S. Mail. He pulled the fastest time freight to the rhythm of the rail. He lost his life on duty in his engine cab so free. I'll pull an eastbound number four and westbound number three last time. Chafin, he's a, a wonderful fella that plays the mandolin and the guitar and the fiddle, and we're missing him tonight. We just send out really good wishes to Doug, uh, but just couldn't be here this evening. So get well soon, Doug Chafin. Mm -hmm. Hey, we've got another song about a train. You feel like talking yeah, about a train? Yeah, this, this train. is a train about Thanksgiving. <laughs> well, yeah, we're getting ready to see all our loved ones. People are traveling, you know, uh, and so. Here's a little song about traveling on the train. Yeah. Gonna take a sentimental journey. Gonna set my heart at ease. Gonna take a sentimental journey to relive old memories. I got my bag, I got my reservation. Kate Long is here, Randy. Yes, the reason. She's an award-winning songwriter, storyteller, and journalist who hails from Fayette County, West Virginia. 
Her songs, which have been recorded by notable artists, are rooted in Appalachian traditional music, and she branches into swing, blues, and jazz. In her performance of Who Will Watch the Home Place, it's a song by Clearwater Connection. It won the International Bluegrass Music Association Song of the Year in 1994. She's also won awards at Merle Fest, South Florida Folk Festival, Careville. I've always wanted to go to Merle Fest. One of these days I'm going to get there. Uh, California-based bluegrass artist Lori Lewis has said of Kate, she writes with a depth of love and understanding that is all too rare in the world. Mm -hmm. um, she's also a writing teacher, a journalist, and a public radio commentator. She was named Public Citizen of the Year, National Association of Social Workers, West Virginia Chapter. Also in 2010, she received the B.B. Maurer West Virginia Folklife Scholar Award, sponsored by the Frank and Jane Gaber West Virginia Folklife Center, and she helped found a healthy living initiative named Try This West Virginia. What has she not done? I love it. What I'm wondering. She hasn't played for us yet. I'm, yes, because we're thrilled right here. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please make a warm welcome right here for Kate Long. Thanks so much. That introduction makes me sound like I'm also a schizophrenic. <laughs> All right, well, I could dip her up in Fayette County, and when I was a kid, I used to run around in the woods just singing stream of consciousness. You know, my mother didn't want me out before breakfast, but I'd climb through the window and creep around pretending I was an Indian princess and that. And I'd be making up songs all along the way, because when we're kids, we know the music is in us. And those of us who become songwriters are the ones that didn't forget about it. So um, this first song, it's a true story, and it's kind of a way of introducing myself. When I was a little country girl, I went to Sunday school, and I colored in all the pictures of Jesus at work and play, and using his daddy's tools. And I used to think how great it would be to be a kid and know you were God. And I started to think, since Jesus was a boy, there must be a little girl God. My eye, my eye, my eye, my eye, my eye. Might I just not be the daughter of God? Now you sing along if you want to. Well, I went to play outside of the woods by the creek camp back of the house. And I pulled little pieces of moss from the rocks And bought what they say when I turned the moss into bread And I pictured a rainbow breaking the clouds And ending up right on my head Though everybody thought I was an ordinary kid I was a little girl god instead My eye, my eye, my eye, my eye My eye just not be the daughter of God Pocahontas County, Marlinton, 
and uh, I had a, uh, they wanted us to have the kids write songs about their local history. And so uh, I got the ranger from Drew Mountain uh, State Park to come up, come and talk to the kids. And he told about the battle, and he told about, you know, the people who died and stuff like that. And one kid reason he said, my dad says you can see those horses that died running up there at night. And another kid said, I heard that too. And they said, yeah, 85 horses died. And the kids just were totally fixated on those horses. And so we wrote a song called 85 Horses. And let me get this thing here. Whoa, it went somewhere. Okay. okay. Let me get myself situated. All right. 85 horses. And you can sing if you want to. I love people to sing. 85 horses, 85 horses died up on Drew Mountain. 85 horses died up on Drew Mountain. It was 1863, the middle of the war. And the horses did not understand what they were fighting for. But sometimes on Drew Mountain, when mist begins to rise, you can see the horses running. You can hear their awful cries. Eighty-five horses in the middle of the fight. Eighty-five horses in the middle of the fight. Cannons all around them, bullets whizzing by. And the horses did not understand why they had to die. But sometimes on Drew Mountain, when this begins to rise, See the horses running, you can hear their awful cries. Lying on the rocks. Eighty-five horses lying on the rocks. No one knew their names. No one prayed for their souls. No one ever said it's sad that they never grew old. But sometimes on true ground. When this begins to rise, you can see the horses running, you can hear their awful cries. Gosh, you know, so, uh, Michelle was asking earlier, you know, about who would you like to play with. Well, I'm happy to have these people with me. <laughs> and what, what Siamese cycle like, well, wonderful. I just love them. You have a, new, you have a big new fan in me. I need the auto heart. <laughs> you know, Kate, you and, you and I were talking a little bit earlier, and I asked you where are you to play before this, and you said, I haven't. 
<laughs> no. She said that, that this that the 1937 flood has brought her out of retirement. That she'd been up at the Augusta Heritage Center in Elkins the past four or five years. And tell me what it's like. The difference between teaching and songwriting, and then getting up here and playing live in front of an audience for you. Well, that's an interesting question. Actually, I have played a lot of places, uh, and uh, Augusta is, is just one of the music camps where I've taught. It's all seamless, you know, it's all about telling stories. And sometimes you sing your stories and sometimes you write them on paper, you know. But uh, I love to uh, get with a bunch of people who also love to tell stories, and particularly the ones that like to set it to music. And uh, I was a writing coach for a long time for the Charleston Gazette, and, uh, and uh, uh, so writing, whatever form it takes, is a big passion of mine and everything comes out of my life. So this is me being all by myself, speaking of things that come out of your life. I ran a flood recovery program. Remember that big flood? Well, some of you will remember. In 1985, we had a huge flood that flooded 29 counties. I mean, it, it was something else. And I ran a flood recovery program up in Tucker County and Randolph County. And what I noticed as I talked to people and went around and we cleaned, and while you cl help people clean up, you talk. And uh, I found out that no matter how much education, money, or whatever people had, they all kind of shared this feeling of, what did I do to make this happen to me? And so I thought, okay, sometimes people can sing things they can't say. Because, you know, that was really a painful thing that people had inside. So I wrote this song called, Ain't I Been Punished Enough? <laughs> and this is real, uh, real community, old time music. And so I need you to sing. Uh, and the chorus goes, Ain't I been punished enough now? Ain't I been punished enough? I'm sorry for each awful thing that I did. Ain't I been punished enough? Some say this blood is a natural thing created by rain without end. Some blame the engineer corps for it all, for damming each curb and each bend. Some say the Lord is punishing us for living so wicked and free. But I know the truth, the terrible truth, it happened because of me. <laughs> Ain't I been punished enough now? Ain't I been punished enough? I'm sorry for each awful thing that I did. Ain't I been punished enough? When I wake up in the deep dark of night, my sins, they look bigger than whales. I remember the time that I screamed at the kids and jerked our old cat by the tail. The money I owe, the people I failed, the time I fell drunk in a pile. I made the good Lord so darned awful mad he flooded thousands of miles. <laughs> Ain't I been punished enough now? Ain't I been punished enough? I'm sorry for each awful thing that I did. Ain't I been punished enough? When I think of the way that I've suffered and cried, it makes me awfully mad. For I know that I'm not the only one who ever did anything bad. I look at my neighbor, I know for a fact, he lives more wicked than I. <laughs> If he caused this flood, then why could not God have flooded him and left me dry? <laughs> Ain't I been punished enough now? Ain't I been punished enough? I'm sorry for each awful thing that I did. Ain't I been punished enough? <laughs> Thank you.
my goodness. Hey. Oh, yeah. I just have a few more questions for you. Well, I just wanted to say that after we'd sing that, people would look around and they'd say, you feel that way too? And, <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden it was okay. Why couldn't have they left Music me dry? Music is therapy. Why couldn't you left me dry? Yeah. <laughs> well, how old you when you got the music bug to start when you were very very small well like i said i mean i used to run around singing stream of consciousness i don't remember a time that i wasn't singing so when you, you know? start writing it down and writing songs and uh, when i was a kid yeah. you know I, I i make up songs about stuff that happened and uh, you know i mean i can't you know i can't exactly remember them but it's I just did. part of your life it's so yeah. long so long and, and how about instrumentation? Did you start uh, accompanying yourself, or did other people? Well, I have you? never learned to play anything particularly well. You know, I mean, I can play well enough to accompany myself on things, and then luckily I get help from people like you guys. Uh, but uh, I've played with some wonderful musicians, and uh, you know, I write songs that I, that I can't play. I just hear them in my head. It's like there's a radio in my head. And I'll sing something, I hear something like, I don't know why I'm suddenly shy. Each time you walk by, I stammer and sigh. I stutter and stumble, mutter and mumble. Each time you say, how are you today? Can I play that? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But I, I just have to get somebody else to play. Well, I just absolutely <laughs> love that you share your talent and you share the uh, ability to put the wall down and, and put words on paper like your workshops with the kids. Do you have more of those types of enriching things coming up? Well, I, I don't have like a date to, to uh, point to, but I, you know, I uh, made the mistake, and lots of people do this, and musicians, you know, I was, I dropped out of music for about the last four years. You know, I, I taught at a couple of music camps, but in general, you know, stopped touring and doing stuff and thanks to these guys they are dragging me out of retirement and I, I hope to uh, to be playing a lot more I love playing for community groups I, you know I play for churches I play for social workers I play for conferences and uh, you know I, and I usually try to make it fit whatever people care about because that's what music is to me it's just another way of talking about what you care about so we've asked the question of who have you played with before that was really like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I got to play with that person. Is, is there well, Robin Kessinger I, and I used to, uh, we played together for about 10 years. And uh, uh, that was an honor and, uh, and a great learning experience and just a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the other side of the coin, is there anybody you would just really go gaga over? Yo-Yo Ma. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if people are looking for music Cindy like... Cindy Lauper. Oh, yeah. Oh. I want her to show me how to do my hair like that. Yeah. That's a great color thing. <laughs> but if, if people are wanting to get in touch with you, can they find you online, Kate Long? Yeah, and I'm going to put, uh, I'm making a website right now, and I'm going to put all my songs on it and let people download them for free if they want them. And uh, uh, you can, <laughs> I forgot to bring any CDs tonight. I have four of them, but you can get them at CD Baby. CDBaby.com, <laughs> and her name is Kate Long, and we'd love for you to play a few more tunes. Okay. All right, all right, ladies and gentlemen, it's incredible singer songwriter Kate Long. Okay, well, Michelle said earlier that my song, that I, uh, my rendition of Who'll Watch the Home Place uh, was by Clearwater Connection, but actually I wrote that. And, uh, and so uh, this is Who'll Watch the Home Place. I was, you know, songs, you get little seeds. I mean, I'm looking at you guys, and I, I, I had a little seed of a song just looking at you. A lot of times the audience, you know, you're looking at me, but you forget I'm looking back at you. <laughs> <laughs> and you all are a good-looking bunch. All right. And, uh, but I've passed a little farm in southern West Virginia, and I heard in my head, uh, When I am gone from here, the little voice sang to me, and if you believe that you're a songwriter and you have an intention of being a songwriter, you're going to be listening for that little voice. And you're going to have your tape recorder with you and you're going to put it on that tape recorder when I am gone from here. And if I hadn't done that, 
da da da. I probably wouldn't have the song, but this song has gone all over the world. I've got versions of it by Japanese bands in Australia. It's kind of strange. It's like a child leaving home. You hope people treat them well. <laughs> The leaves are falling and turning in showers of cold As the postman climbs up our long hill And there's sympathy written all over his face As he hands me a couple more bills Who would watch the home play? A lovely green nook by a clear running stream. It was my place when I was quite small, and its creatures and sounds could soothe my worst pains. But today they don't ease me at all. Virginians, you know, we are such home-loving people. Well, here I am, lucky enough to have these guys play with me again. <laughs> there it went. <laughs> Good thing there is. I know what I'm getting Kate for Christmas now. <laughs> How about a new brain? <laughs> if I'd remembered to bring my stamp, that would have happened. I'm so sorry. No problem. <laughs> ah, I'm writing songs now called things like colander brain. <laughs> you know, that happens. And this one, I find myself writing a lot of songs because I'm old now. And so I'm writing songs about being old. And this one, after I sing it, 
always two or three people come up and say, this happened to me. I am an old, wrinkly, white woman. All my kin are dead. I got a lot of crazy notions rolling round my head. My George, he had a heart attack. They laid him in the ground. But George would never leave me. George is still around. And I know what I know. I feel what I there ain't nothing in this world can tell me this ain't real My George, he used to tickle me I will not tell you where <laughs> We laugh and holler, carry on And people stop and stare Well, last night when I was cooking beans, someone tickled me, and I said, it's you, you crazy fool, I do not have to see, but I know what I know, I feel what I feel, there ain't nothing in this world can tell me this ain't real. He's cradling me so tenderly He's whispering in my hair He says, don't worry Lizzie, it'll be alright I'm always here, just beyond your sight <laughs> And I know what I know, I feel what I feel there ain't nothing in this world can tell me this ain't real. Hi. <laughs> woo, woo. <laughs> My George, he told St. Peter, no, he said, I will not go. As long as Lizzie walks this earth, my spirit stays below. So Lizzie, I am waiting here, waiting here for you. And as soon as you draw your last breath, we'll go waltzing through. And I know what I know, I feel what I feel. There ain't nothing in this world can tell me this ain't real. Yes, I know what I know. I feel what I feel. There ain't nothing in this world can tell me this ain't real. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Kate. We'd just like to thank everybody that's attended um, and, and helping out the Boys and Girls Club of Huntington. It's a tremendous organization. We just deeply appreciate the crowd has come out tonight. We know that there's a lot of things to do on a Saturday night. We're just so glad you joined us here at Route 60. How about it one more time for our house band, the 1937 Club? <laughs> Are losing their shirts. 
And all of the brave Union soldier boys sleep in the dirt. Where you go and die, there was a reason to hurt. All of All of the calico dresses, the gingham and lace. Are up in the attic with grandfather's Derringer cage. Their words whispered down in the parlor, a shadowy Heavy with one more beginning here in Spoon River. Tell us something, Jim. Jim Rumbaugh. the dance, Mary Perkins, I like you right well. You know the union's preserved, and if you listen, you'll hear all the bells. There must be a heaven, the Lord knows I've seen, mostly hell. My rig is outside, coming right from the morning here in the Spoon River. Take it home, Paul. Must be a heaven, though Lord knows I've seen mostly hell. My rig is outside, coming right through the morning here in Spoon River. And again, we're missing our friend Doug Chapin and Sam St. Clair tonight, so keeping them close in thought. Randy Owen, what a wonderful show we've had tonight. We've had some great performers.
headliner Kate Long, as well as Saw Recycle kicking things off as our first group yeah. this evening. Just fantastic, and uh, make sure that everybody checks us out on Facebook. You can go to our website, Route60SaturdayNight.com, and take a look at everything. Uh, tell friends about and share our fun show with. We're grateful to all of you that come out tonight and your support for the Boys and Girls Club of Huntington. And don't forget, in December, we're going to be here the third Saturday in December with our last show of the season. So if you're looking for something to do during the holidays, in December, we'll be here again with another show. These folks here at Route 60 Music are incredible to lend us the stage space. It's Thank wonderful. You. Mike McCord, Paul Calico, Mike Bennett, all the players, everybody here, thank you so much for what you do and the beautiful setup you have here. Um, I'm just... Uh, Believe it or not, at a loss for words. <laughs> We've been lost without our live audience, so we hope to see you in December and again next season. And until we meet again, be safe and enjoy yourselves. Thanks again to Siamese Cycle and to Kate Wong. Here's the 1937 flood. Good night, everybody.